Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. Let me echo what Michael said just a moment ago about Fellowship Bentonville. Uh, we do not have our certificate of occupancy yet, and so that's the reason he said, Lord willing. <laughs> but we do have an opening date, uh, February the 27th, and, and we're really, really fired up about that. Looking forward to it. But I also wanted to um, encourage you to join us for our open house on February the 20th. The, we, we have set that date. Uh, at uh, 5 p.m. on February the 20th. If you don't know how to get there, remember 88. It's exit 88, about 30 minutes from here. And you just cross back over the interstate and take the first right, and you'll see us up there about a mile. We sit right on the interstate. And uh, that's February the 20th at 5 o'clock. And uh, so, indeed, please pray. Uh, but we're really excited about that. And you can go to fellowshipbentonville.org and, and see progress. We're thrilled uh, through your generosity and the generosity of people in all of our congregations. Uh, we only lack about probably uh, nine million having it paid for. And I predict that by this time next year, I will be coming to you saying that it's been built and it's been paid for in full, just like we did here. We built it and we paid for it all in five years and they can move on. Also along that line, I want to thank you for your generosity to the gift over uh, Christmas. Uh, over $800,000 was given to the gift this year, and so thank you. Uh, the elders are in the process right now. They have all the requests that have been made, and they're praying over that, and literally the funds that you gave toward that will help thousands of people all over the world. So thank you for your generosity to the gift and to our year-end giving uh, but just can't say thank you enough for all that you do in that realm. I have to keep up with paying the bills, and so I've, I'm always sensitive to those things because we want to be a healthy church. And every year our auditor says that our church is one of the most healthy organizations he works with. And uh, Kent, you were a part of that back when uh, the auditor was saying that every year, and he still says it every year. So thank you. Well, we are in the book of Jonah Jonah, in your Bible, and the minor prophets. Minor, not because they're less important, but because they're just smaller books. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, the fifth one of the minor prophets. So if you want to turn there, we're in chapter 4 today. Jonah, here's something I want you to remember today. Faith is more clearly expressed in the way we live than in what we claim to believe. Write that down, take a picture of it, look at it on the slides. Faith is more clearly expressed in the way we live than in what we claim to believe. When you read the book of Jonah, I know what you think of. You think about the guy and the fish. Uh, you think about the, the Ninevites. There are a lot of things we think about but the thesis of Jonah is this. What we are to learn from the book of Jonah is this, that his heart, the prophet of God, the voice of God to the people during that time. I mean, you think about Samuel. When Samuel said, thus saith the Lord, the ground shook. He was the mouthpiece of God to these people. And this mouthpiece of God, Jonah, his heart did not mirror the heart of God. His heart did not mirror the heart of God. It's not about the fish, not about the shipwreck, not about the Ninevites, but it's about his heart. And so let's read the fourth chapter of the book of Jonah. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong because the Ninevites had repented and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord? Notice it's all caps. And so that's Yahweh, the one who was, who is, and who always will be. The name that God had given himself. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to prevent by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, 
a God who relents from sending calamity. And now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. And there he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. And then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plan? Look at this. Jonah said, it is. It is. And I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant that you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals. My Old Old Testament history professor in seminary said that Jonah is the greatest missionary book in the Bible. Don't overlook the significance of what God did in the hearts of the Ninevites. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Do you ever get angry? I mean, really angry. Stomping, spitting, mad, throw stuff, angry. Some of you are saying, no. Not me, I don't get angry. Well, we hope your halo doesn't get in your way. There are some of us who get angry at times. And, and, and God, amen, right over here. Yeah, I heard you. We get angry at times. And, and you know, we, we'd like to think it's a righteous anger, but most of the time it's not. God reserves that for himself because he knows how to handle it, and we don't. He's just told us to love, all right? But there are times when we get angry about things. I've got a little four-year-old grandson. His name is Judah. And um, I have this relief valve that when I get angry, and, and I've never even noticed it, but my kids have always made fun of me for it, my wife as well. But it's just when I get angry about something and I'm stewing on it, I have this thing that I do, and it's... <clears throat> And they know I'm really at that point when they hear me go, <clears throat> it's just letting off a little steam, I guess. Well, my grandson was with me, and, and uh, he had asked to do something. Pops, can I do this? And, and I said, no, we can't do that. And he turned, and he was walking away, and he walked by my wife, and she heard him go, <clears throat> and she said, he did it. He made the same sound that you made. And he had never heard me make that sound before, but I guess it's just genetic. Sometimes we get angry. Sometimes we get angry and we say, well, Jesus got angry when he tossed the money changers out of the temple. Yes, he did. But he was Jesus. God reserves that from, for himself. There's an idiom in the Old Testament uh, that anger literally means the nose burns. The nose burns. Well, that's what Jonah was. Jonah was angry. Throughout the book, chapter one, Jonah is in Israel. He was the reluctant fleeing prophet. Then in chapter two, he was in the fish. He was the fish-smelling redirected prophet. In chapter 3, he is in Nineveh, situated on the eastern bank of the Tigris, in the modern city of Mosul. That's where Nineveh was. It's right 
near Mosul and so large that it will probably never be fully excavated. And there he was the preaching prophet. And in chapter four, Jonah is outside of Nineveh, but he's in a mood. He's the pouting prophet. That's how I like to think about Jonah. He was the pouting prophet. We're going to see in Jonah that you can be right, but at the same time be oh so wrong. We're going to see what Jonah was right about and, and what he was wrong about. By the way, Jonah is no heroic figure. I had someone call me recently and said, I, I, I don't understand what you guys are talking about, Jonah. You're not saying anything good. If you go to Hebrews chapter 11 and look in the heroes of faith, you're not going to find Jonah's name. He was indeed the pouting prophet. He was a great preacher, no doubt a very effective one as he went into Nineveh. But he acted disobediently and he did not mirror the great heart of God. He hated the Ninevites. They were a brutal, barbaric people which... Garland illustrated for you last week. They would impale people outside their city walls. We don't know why they were so ready to repent, but I addressed that in the podcast with, with Michael, and so I, I, I won't do that here. There's one possibility. So what have we seen so far? God provided Jonah. God provided, this is a word that's throughout this book, but I, I, I want to add a couple to it. Jo God provided Jonah, a very effective preacher, to go in to preach these people whose heart, their hearts were being prepared. You know, and that's something that we have to remember too. These, these Ninevites, if, if you had told the world back then that the Ninevites are ready to, to come to God, they'd say, nah, not the Ninevites. No, that's a brutal, barbaric people. Never. And it's a good reminder for us, for those people who work around us, God may be preparing their hearts in ways that you don't realize. To hear the gospel. To know him. And God's just waiting for you to speak to them, just to open the door so that they might listen. My grandfather was like that. I prayed for him for over 25 years. The last time I shared with me, shared with him, he, he cursed me and got up and left the room. But God was preparing his heart. And he had a heart attack. And I went and sat down with him and shared the gospel with him one more time. And I didn't know if I was going to cause him to stroke out if I asked him the question. I said, do you want to pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart? And he said, yeah. <laughs> Here he was at the end of his life. And I thought later, how can someone project the Lord all these years and then at the end of their life come and accept him and it be real? And then God reminded me of the parable of the workers where some came in the morning, some came in the afternoon, some came right before quitting time, but the master paid them all the same. Why? Because it was his to give. And it's not what we can ever do or earn or deserve for salvation. It's what Jesus has done for us. And it is his to give. Don't ever give up on someone you're praying for to receive Christ. You just keep on trying. He provided an opportunity to the, to, to the Ninevites and to Jonah. It was a great opportunity to mirror the great heart of God, to be imago Dei, to be God's image bearer to the Ninevites. He provided a great fish. We're, we're, we're told that when he went 500 miles, or he could have gone 500 miles to Nineveh, but he decided, look at the map. He decided to go 2,500 miles in the other direction. He was going on a European vacation, on a cruise. But God redirected that, didn't he? He provided deliverance from the great fish and grace to the Ninevites. And so in chapter, uh, verse 1 of chapter 4, it says, but to Jonah. That's a dangerous premise right there because it's running opposite of God. But to Jonah, but to Mickey, but to Clark, but to Michael, but to David. When we start thinking, hey, wait a second, this is, 
This is not the way it ought to work. We're forgetting that God may have a different plan. He needed God's perspective more than his own perspective. And that's why we have the word so that we learn God's perspective. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. The fact that they had repented and God relented seemed very wrong to Jonah. And he was running everything through his grid. But remember what Proverbs 14, 12 said. There is a way that seems right to us, but in, in the end, it leads to death. That's why we need God's perspective. Jonah became angry because he knew what God would do if they repented. He was a prophet of God, and, and he knew the character of God. They had bowed the knee in repentance. And so he prayed to the Lord. He prayed to the Lord, but notice in his prayer how many personal pronouns are used. Notice how selfish this prayer is. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to prevent by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. There's our word, chesed. It's a word describing God's covenant love. A God who relents from sending calamity. In other words, I told you so, God. I told you what would happen. How did Jonah know what God would do? Is because he knew the scriptures. He knew the character of God. Look at what he said, how many times it's used throughout the scriptures in the Old Testament. Exodus, look at Exodus. Compassionate and gracious, God, slow to anger, abounding in love. Look at Numbers 14. Slow to anger, abounding in love. Nehemiah. Gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. Psalm 86, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Psalm 103, the Lord is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Psalm 145, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. Joel 2.13, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. He knew the character of God. He's slow to anger. He's compassionate. He's gracious. He abounds in love because he is love. In verse 3, now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Wait a second. Here's the prophet of God saying, I'd rather die than live any longer. You know, that... that that's happened in other places in the Old Testament. With the prophet of Elijah, look at 1 Kings 19, 3 through 4. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. This is after he had defeated the prophets of Baal. And when he came to Beersheba in, in, in Judah, he ran as far as he could. He left his servant there, and, and, and while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. The same thing happened to Moses in Numbers 11. God was angry with him. The people were angry with him, and he had had enough. And he said, if things are going to be like this, take my life. I'm ready to go. Well, let me remind you of something. That's not our choice to make. God appoints the time that we are born and when we die. And so if these thoughts ever come into your mind, remember, that is not from God. And you need to get help. And if anyone ever says that to you, you always take it seriously and you get them help. If someone is at the point where they're, they want their life to end, we got to give them help because it's not our decision. You see, our suffering has the possibility of being used by God in a positive way. Elizabeth Elliot said this, and you remember her husband, Jim Elliot, 
who was killed by the Aka Indians. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And he gave his life. But she said, the deepest things that I have learned in my own life have come from the deepest suffering. And out of the deepest waters and the hottest fires have come the deepest things that I know about God. It is in those darkest valleys that God reveals himself in ways we could not have known him otherwise. Sometimes God takes us through the valley so that we might grow in our relationship with him. And I bet we could go all around this room and talk to those of you who have been through suffering times and you came out of it and said, yes, I grew in my relationship with God. Or my life turned around because God put me flat in my back so I had to look up. When those times of suffering come, we have to look for God. I often ask people when I visit them in the, in the hospital or talk with them on the phone and know they're going through a rough time, what is God teaching you? What is God teaching you right now? Verse 4. But the Lord replied. That's always a scary thing. I always think about Job. In Job 38 through 42, when the scripture says that the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. And he said, stand up, brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. Woo! And then the Lord replied. Is it right for you to be angry? It's like God is saying, what's wrong with you, Jonah? What's wrong with you? These people have repented. What's wrong with you? And look what happens. Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city and there made himself a shelter. He sat in his shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. He's sitting outside the city and just looking at it. It's, it's like he's expecting Sodom and Gomorrah to come to this city, that God's going to change his mind and the city's going to be burned with fire or something. I don't know. But he just sat out there east on the, on the hilly side watching and waiting. He had the opportunity to be a hero, but he blew it. And so God provided something else. He provided a leafy plant, a leafy plant. Now, verse 6 says, Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah and to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. Oh, look at this. Think in terms of something, elephant ears or something like that. Uh, scholars have have uh, ventured that it might have been a, a castor bean plant which uh, thrives in the heat and it has big leaves. We don't know what the plant was, but he was so happy about the plant. Good for you, Jonah. Glad you got some comfort. But then the next day, God provides a worm. If you've grown tomatoes in southern Arkansas, it's called a cutworm. Because right down at the ground, it just cuts the plant off. Some of you are smiling. You know what I'm talking about. You'll have this beautiful tomato plant. You walk out the next day, and it's lying on the ground because a cutworm has gotten it. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, a cutworm, I believe, which chewed the plant so that it withered. You see, God doesn't deal with just big fish and leafy plants. He also deals in worms. We've been in situations like that. Things are going well all of a sudden, and then bam, God drives us to our knees where we should have been in the first place. And when the sun rose, verse 8, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die. Again, there we see it. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said. Well, that's a bold thing to say to God. He's asked him that question twice. And now he says boldly, it is, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. Now, this was a hot place. If, if any of you served in the military there near Mosul, anyone? Anyone? Yeah, right here. 
You did? Yeah, you served there? How hot does it get? Really, really hot. It gets really hot near Mosul. Hey, by the way, thank you for your service. Thank you. Let's thank him for his service. Yeah. It gets really, really hot, 120 degrees sometimes, and it was bearing down on his head. We have a witness here how hot it gets there where Nineveh was. It gets really, really hot, and so it was scorching down on his head. The desert. And then God spoke to him. Verse 10, God summarizes it. He said, but the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant. Though you did not tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? In other words, they didn't have an idea. They didn't have an idea. And here the book of Jonah ends with a question. It's left unanswered. It's a contrast between the gracious heart of God, the kind, compassionate, hesed, covenant love of God for a cruel people. This was an unbelievable opportunity for the Ninevites to repent and come to God. You see, 150 years later, they're going to be wiped out of existence by the Neo-Babylonian Empire. But here in this one shining moment, God used his mouthpiece, Jonah, to walk through the city to tell them about him, and they repented. They repented and bowed the knee before God. Jonah was right about God. He was kind and compassionate, gracious, loving, far beyond what we could ever imagine. Well, just a few things we can learn from Jonah, and we could go through a long list, but, but, but one, disobedience leads to dissent. If we find ourselves getting in a pattern of disobedience to God, you're going to go down, 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 down. We have to make right choices because if we don't, we'll go the wrong direction. The next one, Jonah was right in his doctrine but wrong in his response. Remember, faith is more clearly expressed in the way I live than what I claim to believe. That's known as churchianity, not Christianity. I just say I believe it because my church says I'm supposed to believe it, but I'm going to live the way that I want to live. That's not God's way for us to live. I thought of an an example this week when my wife has used this with me several times before when she said, "It's it's not what you said, it's the way you said it. It's not what you said, it's it's the way you said it. Oh, I might have been right in what I said, but the way that I said it was all wrong. Ladies, you're welcome to use that, all right? And I'll I'll throw Mark Schatzman under the bus. His wife said to him, just because you're better with words doesn't mean you're right. (laughs) I thought that one was great. And the last thing, my heart should mirror the heart of God. For people, it doesn't matter who they are or what they've done. They need the Lord. I used to sing that song a long time ago. Every day they pass me by. I can see it in their eyes. Empty people filled with care, headed who knows where. On they go through private pain, living fear to fear. Laughter hides their silent cries. Only Jesus hears. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, he's the open door. When will we realize that people need the Lord? All around us. 
The Ninevites found him. There are people all around us who need him. Hudson Taylor tells a story about when he was in China. He was on a boat. He, he was the great missionary to China. He was on a boat, and he met a man named Peter. And he witnessed to Peter. And although Peter became emotional and, and even wept, he hadn't made a decision yet to follow the Lord, but he did promise that he would go with Hudson and he would hear him preach. Hudson went back to his room there on the boat, and then he heard a commotion out on the deck and a splash, and he ran back out there, and they told him that Peter had fallen into the water. He couldn't believe they were just standing there watching. Hudson jumped into the water and immediately tried to find Peter, but he couldn't find him. The boat was being pushed along by the wind. And he saw some fishermen there, and he asked them, come help, come help, a man is drowning. And they said, we're busy fishing. And he said, please come help, throw your nets out and drag. Help me find this man before it's too late. And they said, how much will you pay us? And he said, $5. $5. And they said, that's not enough. And he said, I'll pay you, I'll pay you $14. And they said, that's not enough. And he said, that's all that I have. I'll give you everything that I have. Please come and drag. And he said, slowly they made their way over and they dragged. And immediately they pulled up Peter. And he had drowned. He wrote this. It'll be on the screen there for you. To myself, this incident was profoundly sad and full of significance, suggesting a far more mournful reality. Were not those fishermen actually guilty of this poor man's death? And that they had the means of saving him at hand? If they would have but used them? Assuredly, they were guilty. And yet, let us pause before we pronounce judgment against them, lest a greater than Nathan answer, Thou art the man. Is it so hard-hearted, so wicked a thing to neglect to save a body? Of how much sorer punishment, then, is he who leaves the soul to perish? And Cain light says, Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord Jesus commands, commands me, commands you, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Shall we say to him, no, it is not convenient? Shall we tell him that we're too busy fishing and cannot go, that we have purchased five yoke of oxen or have married or engaged in other or more interesting pursuits and cannot go? Let us remember, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So before we get too tough on Jonah, remember that we've been told as well to reach the world for Christ. As he was told to go to Nineveh, we've been told to go to the world. So maybe I'm more like Jonah than I realize. Let's pray. Would you just take a moment and do some business with God? Just reflect on your own life, where you are. Where you stand with God. Have you been running the other direction? Is God convicting you and saying, are you sure you want to go this way? And you say to him, yes. I'm not ready to go your way yet. Oh, Lord, remind us often that there will come a day when we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That we will face you. And like Jonah, we must give an answer. 
We thank you, Lord, for the principles that we've learned in this book. And Lord, we want our faith to be clearly expressed in the way we live. 